hello everyone let's see we're still loading in hello hello welcome welcome to um civic engagement in the k-12 classroom i'm going to put my name is kimberly rosenfeld and before we get started i'm putting in the chat a link to a google document that we're going to ask you to open and while people are still loading in we'd like you to sign in on this so I will share my screen, but the link is now in the chat. It's a collaborative document. And then we'll get started in just a minute. So let me kind of share my screen with you. And hopefully uh, you can not, uh, here we go. So this is where you're gonna wanna sign in. Everyone can see that. So just take a minute or two and put your name and if you would just share your institution and whether your role, faculty, student, or administrator. And if you have any questions, we have the chat, feel free to post it in the chat and we'll get started in just another minute or two, just giving folks time to get in. So again, here's the URL. And if you can open this screen on the side, it's a participant guide. So we will be using this throughout our presentation today. I see Jerry Ramos is in there signing in. Thank you, Jerry. It says yeah, access denied. Okay, let me work on that. If you have access denied, let me work on that for you. Okay, hold on just a minute. I'm gonna stop sharing and we'll get everyone to do that. Let's see. Let's see, sometimes, oh, okay. Let me, um... okay. All right, try it now, it should work. So sometimes, Kimberly, also, as people come to, into the room, yeah. you have to repost that because they don't see what you've already posted. Okay, so yeah. let's repost it. All right, everyone, please try again, um, Kenny and Ava, and let us know. Oh, Polly um, says it works. Okay, good. And there's the URL. So we're just getting signed in, those of you who are joining us. Um, we're just gonna start in one minute. Oh good, and he says success. And you'll wanna keep this open. Here's the URL again. You wanna get signed in and keep this open and kind of position it next to your Zoom screen. This is our participant guide today. So thank you so much. We, I see people are in there. So let's see, if there isn't anyone else in the waiting room. So I think we should go ahead and get started. But while we're getting started, please feel free to continue to sign in, okay? And again, um, have your chat open if you have any questions as we get started. So um, let me first start with introductions and then I have a PowerPoint I'm going to open. So um, I'm Kimberly Rosenfeld. I teach at Cerritos Community College District. I am the education department chair and I also am housed in the communication studies department. I'm here with my two colleagues and friends and partners in crime in the, in the area of civic engagement and civic literacy. Patty Robinson, who's going to introduce herself in a moment, and Jan Connell. So Patty, would you do a brief intro? Yes, hi everyone, I'm Patty Robinson. I'm faculty director of civic and community engagement at College of the Canyons, and I'm honored to be here. Hi everybody, I'm Jan Connell, and glad to be here, future teachers and existing teachers. Uh, I am from Cerritos College originally, and I work as a part-timer there now was a full-timer for 40 years, um, also part of our teacher track program there, um, and a counselor. But right now, I wear the hat of uh, an organization called 3CSN, which is the California Community College Success Network. And you can reach that at 3CSN.org. I highly encourage you to check that out. Okay, hey, so we're gonna get started here. I'm gonna share a PowerPoint with you. So I'm gonna screen share here again. Um, just give me one second here to share. And please let me know if there's any glitches in that sharing, sometimes those PowerPoints. So let's just do a present mode. Okay, so we're part of the Teach for LA virtual workshop series. Um, and we are um, so happy, like I say, to be here. We'll be with you from 10 to 11.30 today. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, hold on a minute. And you all, did that advance for you? Yes. You all see that? Okay, good. 
All right, so here on our first slide, we have all of our contact information, but you're also going to see that contact information is on the participant guide, which is that participant guide is for you to keep and download. And if after the presentation, you wanna reach out to any of us, uh, you have our contact information there. Okay, so now it's a little slow and I try to advance it, so give me a sec, here we go. So um, we have some images here that I wanna get you thinking about, although I don't really need to probably push this too hard because we see most of it every day. Um, we have a lot of crises going on in our world. We have um, housing insecurity and a problem with homelessness, especially here in LA. It seems to have gotten only worse over the years. Same with our forest fires. Um, we seem to have uh, more aggressive and pervasive fires each and every year. And then of course we have an ongoing problem with fake news or um, news that um, we don't know where it's coming from and manipulation through social media. So we were faced as educators with a lot, but then we also had COVID-19 hit us, right? That was the last thing we really needed in our world. And now we are living in the midst of this pandemic. What has this meant for our schools? Well, here's some recent headlines. This school year has been unlike any other. Some examples of how the world of education has responded to the pandemic. I think we're all still in this grand laboratory of trying to figure out how to make this work, right? At all levels, K all the way through college level. Uh, why COVID-19 will explode existing academic achievement gaps from the Washington Post. Here's another one. The pandemic has parents fleeing from schools, maybe forever. COVID-19 is a catalyst for families who are already skeptical of the traditional school system and are now thinking about leaving it for good, the Atlantic. And finally, what will happen to education when COVID-19 pandemic is over? The Washington Times. So with all of this, that it's coming at us at once, how can we best serve our K-12 students in this, all of this unrest? This is where I'm gonna turn it over to Patty. So one of the things that I want everyone to think about is that um, there are two very important documents that um, I highly, highly recommend that you all take a look at. Um, these documents are incredibly important, not only for higher education, but specifically for K through 12. And that would be the document on the, um, to my right, the, the Guardian of Democracy. A Crucible Moment was written in 2012, and it has really been the primary publication that is guiding the work of civic engagement in higher education right now. Um, you'll see a lot of quotes that we're using throughout this presentation that come from this document. It's 136 pages long. It's very short. It's, it's free. Uh, it's a PDF online, um, but it, it is a great look at what the role and obligation of higher education really should be as we take a look at the problems that are pressing um, throughout our country today um, with regard to a lack of civic knowledge. The second document, Guardian of Democracy, which was published about the same time, um, I, I couldn't get the exact date, I think it's maybe a year after, um, is looking at the problem, but in K through 12. And so for those of you who are going to be working specifically with K through 12, I highly recommend that you take a look at this document. Again, it's free, it's online, you can download it. It's not that long, but it really goes into the major issues confronting K through 12 and how K through 12 can play an incredible role in helping um, increase our civic knowledge and literacy throughout our country. So when we talk about civic literacy, um, what is the exact definition? And I wanna sort of preface this by saying that we oftentimes use the term civic engagement. And the term civic engagement is oftentimes looked at in a broader context of making social change, using both political and non-political ways to affect our communities um, for the good of, of our communities, for the good of our nation, for the good of the world. Civic literacy, literacy is a little bit more specific so this particular definition, again, comes from a crucible moment. 
It is the cultivation of foundational knowledge um, about fundamental principles and debates um, regarding democracy expressed over time. Um, it's important that we consider these ideas both within a US and um, a global context. It is also the familiarity with several historical struggles, campaigns, and social movements um, that have taken part as a way to try and fulfill as well as promote and keep our democracy alive. It is also the ability to think critically about those issues um, that we, we need to seek and evaluate information about through different issues um, and looking at those public consequences. So really civic literacy is more than just about history and government and politics. It's about looking at this within this larger context of how we bring about change and how only through knowledge we can actually bring about that change. And so civic literacy isn't something that should just be taught in higher education. It needs to start in kindergarten. And so then the civic mission, which is also very much connected to this. Um, some of you have probably heard about the Truman Commission that came out right after World War uh, II. Um, what was happening then is that uh, President Truman put together a, a group of scholars and um, academicians uh, from around the country that really took a look at higher education. Up until this point, education, or at least higher education, was primarily found in the hands of those who had money. In other words, it wasn't something open to the masses. After the Truman Commission came to its findings, they actually su su suggested that we need to look at the civic mission as part of a growing democracy. That in other words, if we are going to have a democracy, we have to have open education. We also have to have the ability to have people live and understand democracy. So it's not something that's, that would only be available to a small group, but it needed to be available to, to the masses. And so one of the terms that comes out of the, the Truman Commission report is also democracy's colleges. And so when we take a look at community colleges, colleges, for example, they are democracies colleges. They are the place where we learn that civic literacy. But also, certainly, we would argue that that literacy and the civic mission has to start early in one's academic career. And again, going back to K through 12 and the importance of that training. And that's, again, one of the points that's brought up in a crucible moment. So K-12 is an important education sector for democracy and civic responsibility. In fact, they argue it is the bedrock and I would argue the same, that if we don't have young kids learning about the civic literacy and responsibility, they're not gonna be able to learn it as they, they progress and they are not going to be good uh, participants of democracy. But, but here's the problem. So this is what we're gonna get into. I'm gonna share a few quotes from you. Uh, the first one's from the crucible moment. Um, K-12 education is the cornerstone of both functioning democracies and college readiness. Despite all the investment in improving the level of schooling in the United States, particularly over the past quarter century, far too little attention has been paid to education for democracy in public schools. And I think what they're getting at here is a lot of time that's relegated to a government or a civics class and people equate it with voting and understanding how our government runs. And yes, that's all part of it, but civic engagement, civic literacy is far broader. So a couple more quotes to share with you again from a crucible moment. Unfortunately, the commitment to foster foundational knowledge about US democracy or to expand civic capacities to shape a better world. And I kind of want to land on that a better world, right? We started with those problems, those big wicked problems that are plaguing us all. In concert with others has been pushed off the priority list in the K through 12 schools, just when we need it the most. And finally, coming from a Boyer article um, written in fact back in the 1990s, but still very true today, many of the civics books are largely disembodied expositions of principles and facts lacking the passion of the conflicts that infuse politics and government with meaning and significance. The student is asked only to master knowledge of the subject rather to, than to put his knowledge to use. Thus, the participatory side, the side that requires the individual to analyze democratic values, processes, and choices is largely ignored. 
And we're making an argument today that this should begin not in their college experience, but in their K-12 experience, and then built, be built on from there. So let's continue here. Oh, I want to go one, one back, Kimberly. Oh, sorry. So I want to build on what, what Kimberly was just saying with participatory um, democracy. Um, again, if we're going to have a democracy, if we're going to have civic literacy, if we're going to have all of the kinds of things we're trying to promote today, that kind of action, that kind of behavior has to start early. And one of the things that I think is extremely important for you as educators who are now being trained, and many of you are already in the field working with, with um, younger students, is this concept of the civic empowerment gap. Um, as you can see, this is a, a, uh, a term that comes from uh, Mira uh, Levinson uh, from her 2012 book, Leave No Citizen Behind. And I know we're playing on a, on a term there. Um, she is a, an educator from Harvard University. And what she's arguing here is that we have a gap in this country. We've all heard about the, the gaps that exist with regard to proficiency in um, uh, different kinds of skills, um, oftentimes the non-proficiency, if you will, with regard to um, English and math scores, readiness. Um, she argues that this is the same that happens with our civic literacy. And she specifically is looking at this empowerment gap between um, minority groups students of color, uh, particularly those who are poor, and also in many cases, first gen students, who in fact do not have the same abilities to navigate within our political system or even in our system period because they don't have the kinds of skill sets needed um, through this kind of civic literacy. And so you can see that this is a very important topic that as educators, we need to pay attention to not only in higher education, but specifically in K through 12. And to give you an idea of how this fits into the work that you're doing, um, you can take a look here um, at these numbers. And so for example, um, when we look at the current and projected K through 12 public school enrollments um, in fall 2019, um, we saw that we have, or we, we see that we have 5.1 million students that are enrolled in the US and 6.2 million in California. When we take a sort of projected look, we see that those numbers are gonna change a bit. And again, part of this has to do with demographic changes, but in 2029, those numbers in the US will be 50.7 million students. And then in California, 6.3 million. Um, that is a huge sum of students to be thinking in terms of that we have the ability to provide them with this kind of civic knowledge. And just to kind of give you a, a, a bigger picture here, and I know this chart's a little bit difficult to read, but this, all you need to do is look at the actual, um, the chart itself, and to see that there is a gap when we start to look at, for example, the projected uh, changes with regard to race and ethnicity of our students. And so what you see here on the left-hand side, um, you, you can see that the number of students who are white or Caucasian will in fact start to decrease from um, fall of 20, um, I'm sorry, from 2000, when we're looking, we're projecting to fall of uh, 2029. So you can see that the number of white students will decrease, but you can also see that the numbers of Hispanic students is increasing as well as um, other students of color. Um, African-Americans going a little bit decreasing and will be a little bit flat by 2029. But again, going back to Levinson's argument, um, these are the students that really are going to be experiencing that gap. So it makes you put this into perspective um, our roles as educators and what we can do, especially in K through 12. <clears throat> so what we'd like to point our attention to is some of the indicators that illustrate the anemic state of civic health in the United States. Again, these indicators, there'll be five of them, come from the crucible moment. Um, one being less than half of 12th graders reported studying international topics as part of their civic education. So less than half. Second point, second indicator that is, half of the United States no longer requires a civic, engage, a civic 
education for high school graduation. So half of our population uh, of high school graduates do not have civics education required. The third indicator is that we are anemic in our civic health is that the opportunities to develop civic skills in high school through community service, school government, service clubs are available disproportionately to wealthier students. So if you live in a district that has wealthy families, you're more likely to have opportunities to engage in community service, school government, service clubs. But if you live in poorer neighborhoods, you are restricted from that. So indicator four, oops, uh-oh, I'm back. I'm back, I'm sorry I got kicked out. I will share screen in a moment. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me, let me continue. I will read off my page. Um, only 24% of our graduating high school seniors scored at the proficiency level in civics in 2010. So fewer than in 2006 or 1998. So that's indicating a downward trend in the students, the high school seniors who are proficient at the uh, or advanced in civics. So we are gaining anemia in our civic health. And then the last indicator pointed out by Crucible Moment is that only 10% of our, our citizens, excuse me, contacted a public official in 2009, 2010. Why is that important? Well, if we are in a democracy and we participate in that, we have elected officials that we need to be in contact with. We need to even know who they are. So I wanna turn it over to our next slide. So we're gonna do a poll uh, based on these questions. I'm gonna turn it over to Patty and I'll be running the poll. All right. And before we start, I just want to just make a comment to something Jan just said, too, because there was a very interesting point with number three of, of the um, indicators that she was going through. Um, and one of the things that you need to keep in mind is that when we get students, and again, number three goes directly to what Levinson is suggesting, that again, you see this discrepancy with the kinds of opportunities that exist for, for students, particularly with regard to um, socioeconomic status that again reflects, uh, in many cases, racial and ethnic um, differences. But I want to say what's really interesting, too, is that the literature shows that earlier that we get students involved in civics or civic work or civic literacy, the more likelihood that they will continue to have that level of participation throughout their entire lives. So that's incredibly important for us to keep in mind as we think in terms of teaching young students. So let's take a look. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say, I hope that it's apparent by now that we as a nation have just totally neglected this aspect of our health, right? Yep. And we are perfectly positioned as educators to do something about that. And keeping it within that medical kind of terminology, um, there's a term called well-being. And mm -hmm. ironically enough, we think only in terms of people oftentimes having well-being, but our society, our nation has well-being as well. And so when we get our students, when we get our citizens engaged, um, our communities can flourish, our nation will flourish. And so that's that, again, taking it to this idea of health. Um, we are a nation that we have the ability to really increase that, that civic health um, with, with our own teaching. So we're gonna look at um, some questions here. And I, I love to do this when I oftentimes will get together in presentations with, uh, with faculty because you oftentimes hear people grumble and go, oh, well, you know, we know this, or it's, it's you know, there are certain people who don't know this. Um, I, I oftentimes put this within the context of, uh, we, we think in terms of uh, many people coming to the country for the first time and, you know, well, they don't, they don't know about our government. They don't know about this or that. But these are questions that actually come from uh, a naturalization exam. And usually there are about a hundred of them that I will show to folks and I'll get them in groups and I'll ask them, can you come up with the answers? And so we're gonna do this right now in sort of a, a modified shorter version. There are five questions 
and you are going to have three responses that Kimberly has put together in a poll. And so she's going to explain exactly how you're going to be able to respond. But let's see if you know the right answers. I'm going to launch the first poll. Here we go. Or the first question. So the first question is, what do the stars on the flag mean? Okay, are they, are they the number of nations in the United Nations? They represent each state in the US or they represent the number of people who wrote the US Constitution. So you can go ahead. And so I'm, people are still voting. So I'll be okay. sharing the results in a moment. And of course, this is anonymous, so just do your best. It's not meant to stress anyone out and don't feel you have to Google it. Exactly. Just answer what you think off the top of your head. Okay, people are trying still voting. Trying to have a little fun here. Yes. yes. Little, meant it, to be fun, not stressful. Yes, stressful. exactly. And it always is so, very fun. Yeah, don't, don't feel you gotta uh, look that up or anything. Okay, I'm gonna give you all about 10 more seconds and then we're gonna share the results. I'll end the poll. Okay. So go. do we want, do we want to do one question at a time here, uh, yeah. Kim, Kimberly yeah, and Jan? Yeah, we're going to do one, one at okay. a time. Here we go. Here's my results. All right. So they represent each state in the U.S. 84% um, of you said yes. So, and that was the correct answer. Yay. So very good. All right. So let's take a look at the second question. How many amendments does the constitution have? 27, 25, or 26? And again, don't feel you got to look this up. Just, just spitball it. <laughs> Whatever you think <laughs> your understanding is. I'll give everyone about 15 more seconds. Okay, 10 more seconds. Going once. 75% of you have voted. All right. Here we go. Here's the results. All right. So it looks like 20, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, 61% said 27, 22% said 25, and 17% said 26. And the correct answer is 25. And I have to admit that when I was trying to remember myself this morning, I wanted to say 26. So um, the correct <laughs> answer is 25. Okay, let's go to question number three. So the third question, can you name the 13 original states? And, um, and we're putting which of the following was one of the original 13 states, which makes it a little easier. So you don't have to name all, <laughs> all 13. Results are still coming in. How about another 15 seconds or so to, again, just. All go. right. So we had Virginia, Texas, and Florida. Um, the answer, we have 75% Virginia, which is correct, 25% Texas, and 0% for Florida. So again, uh, Virginia, the correct answer. So let's go to the fourth question. How many US sen senators are there? Are there 200, 100, or 50? Okay, 15 more seconds. We got about 62% of you who voted. Okay, here we go. All right. So we had 200 at 5%, 100 senators at 89%, and then 11% um, of you said 50. The correct answer is 100. Um, and it's interesting because there's been so much discussion about this with what's still happening with our political process after the election. All right, so let's go to the fifth question. Can you name the two senators from your state? Um, but we, we actually here have the question reworded, which of the following is a US senator from California? Diane Feinstein, uh, Adam Schiff, or Kevin McCarthy? everyone about 15 more seconds. Okay, going once. 
once, going twice, and then end the poll. Here we go. All right. So um, Diane Feinstein, yes, she is a senator. Uh, Schiff and McCarthy are not. So um, we had 70% for Adam Schiff and 17% for Kevin McCarthy. 67% uh, of us could identify Dianne Feinstein. So interesting. Um, you get the, the sense of how this works with regard to the citizenship questions. And what's really fun if you do this um, in a class, uh, and, and I've done it again in many situations, who do you think are the, the, the students or, or the faculty who can answer the most questions? They are the, the, the faculty or the students who have actually come from another country and have had to study for the naturalization exam. So the point being is that here we are, for the most part, most of us have been brought up in the United States. We've gone through our own educational system and we struggle to answer these questions. So this gives you a really interesting kind of perspective on this idea of what we're trying to show you that civic literacy is so lacking in our, our, our country. And again, think in terms of how many of us um, are, again, either we've already had or gone through college and have our degrees or you're going through college. And again, we're able to answer these questions. So just a fun way of showing that, yeah, we need to increase our civic literacy in our country. So continuing on that, we're going to talk about reinvesting in the fundamental civic missions of schools. And so this is uh, some recommendations that have come out of a collection of documents. So I can't just you know, anchor it on one, but a lot of them are from the crucible moment. But I'm going to read through these with you. And I just want to get you thinking as I go through them of your own classrooms the ones that you're in and the ones that eventually you will be teaching, right? So building knowledge of social issues and institutions to give students understanding of democracy. So it's not just teaching democracy as here's the constitution, but the whole social political um, landscape, right? That make up a democracy, it's bigger than that. Uh, two, developing appreciation, open-mindedness, and capacity to engage in different points of views and cultures. So these are, you know, getting people to look at things from uh, like debating issues and debating both sides of those issues, looking at how different cultures are addressing some of these problems and, and unpacking that a little bit. It's getting people out of their, um, their uh, perspective, right? And getting them to engage with other perspectives. Third, engaging in civic problem solving and experiences that are active and not passive. And I really want to emphasize that active notion of getting students to write letters or getting them to go out in their community and um, see what's going on with our environment, for example. Um, getting them to really get some hands-on experience here other, rather than just in the classroom and in the library, right? Part of us being democratically engaged is for us to be active and it's important to model that in the classroom. Fostering civility, I think this is a really important one. You know, how to disagree respectfully, right? How to, how to agree to disagree and still be able to sit in the same room and have discussions. Ethical integrity and mutual respect, um, something that really needs in, to be taught as part of being that uh, democratic citizen and making connections between what students learn and how they live. And I really like this one because so much uh, our students feel that the classroom is over here and there's no connection to how they live their lives. And um, there is a connection. And sometimes we need to make that for them or help them make that connection. And the civic engagement uh, curriculum is part of, of doing that, helps to, to make that happen. So, um, I'm gonna turn this over to Jan because now we wanna get you to think about some of these ideas a little bit and we'll be doing some breakout rooms. Jan? Right, thank you. <clears throat> We're gonna put everybody in a room with some partners and um, we're gonna tap your intelligence. We're gonna tap your experiences. We're gonna tap your creativity and have some fun um, doing it as well. So in a moment, you will be um, asked to join a room, but before we let you loose, let me explain what we'd like you to do. Um, on um, the screen, you're gonna see some standards 
uh, that we are um, going to ask you to focus on. And each room will have a different standard to focus on in terms of identifying how you might use this standard to bring about greater civic literacy or civic engagement. So for example, if you're in the room with the uh, standard six, we're gonna ask you to talk with your partners in that room about how you might in your classroom work to assess how point of view or purpose shapes the content and style of a text or a piece of reading. But in that vein, could you contextualize, could you do that with the goal of helping students develop greater civic literacy or civic engagement? So we're asking you to find the intersection between the standard that you're going to be uh, working on, along with using it to promote civic literacy and civic engagement. So Kimberly, could I get you to go to the next slide real quick? Oh, sorry. Uh, whoa. Oh. Hold on. <laughs> ah, okay. Um, I think I've just lost something. So uh, let me see. Uh, I'm patient. Sorry, guys, um, I think when I got kicked out of here, let me stop sharing my screen for a moment. I will get that up for you in just a minute. Okay. If you just want to, oh, I found it. Um, here we go. Okay, I'm gonna go to the next slide and here we go. Let me share again. So sorry, guys. That's okay. okay. Here we go. Yeah. Okay, so um, there will be some rooms that are dedicated to the science standard. And there are many standards um, on the linked document. Yeah. So if you're in that room, you can pick any one of those issues that you see on that document. The goal is to have you think about how you could do one of these things in the context of promoting civic literacy or, and or civic engagement. So for instance, uh, students conducting investigations, solving problems, engaging in discussions with teachers guidance. So if you're the teacher and you're working uh, with your students to do that, what ideas do you have? And the more concrete, the better, it'd be great, uh, for navigating students towards becoming more civic literate uh, and uh, engaged. So you will have a uh, Google screen for you to actually write something, post pictures, whatever that characterizes your discussion. So if I could get you off of the uh, participant guide, uh, once you are assigned your room, you will open that link and you're going to go to the slide that corresponds with your group, your room number. So you will see at the top of your room, the number that you're in. And I'd like you and your roommates to write only on the slide that is coordinated with your room number. I hope that makes sense. If you have any problems, once you're in the room, there's at the bottom, you can ask for help. There's a, a way for you to uh, get one of us outside of the room to come in and help. Before, Does that make Yeah, yes, and the instructions to repeat the instructions are repeated here with the prompt and everything. So just you can kind of use that and then it's all from this sheet. So you just want to click on this link here. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead, Jan. Sorry. Just wanted to add Oh, that. I just want to make sure before people before people get sent into their room, if there are any uh, anything I can clarify about what we'd like you to do. So do we have a way for people to indicate in the chat? Or the maybe the reactions? Could you um, give us a thumbs up if you're ready to go under reactions? Does that make sense? Maybe we'll if, put it this way. If you have a question, post it in the chat. Maybe I'll just go ahead and send them. Sound good? Has okay. everyone gone over to breakout rooms before? Um, 
just in case you haven't, I'm sure a lot of you have done this, you're going to get a, a screen's going to come up that's going to ask you to click on it to accept and you'll be taken to the other room. And then I'll be broadcasting your time signals. We're probably going to give you about hopefully 15 to 20 minutes. Um, we'll see uh, how, how it's going. And again, there's a mechanism you can call us in if you have questions. Okay, so I'm going to create uh, the room. Oh, please put the link in the chat. Here's a link to the collaborative document. There you go, Irene. Yeah, so if any of you joined late or got kicked out like I did, the chat gets uh, reset. So I put it in twice. All right, I'm going to send you now. Ready? Here we go. So Kimberly, do you want me to go to the breakout room? Because I'm getting an invitation. Yeah, I think it would be great. You ask okay. Patty if you could pop in. I will do that. Yes, I'll do that. Okay. Oh, one guy is by himself in room six. Uh, no, we got two people in that room. Okay, I've got four in another. Hi, Jan, are they doing okay? Oh, oh, you're muted. Hold on, you're muted. Oh, ah, hold on. Okay. You're back, okay. So, Patty and I were put in the same room. So oh. I thought, well, maybe I'll go to a different room. Yeah, oh, and there's one guy by himself. Okay, the guy in six, so I'm gonna um, send you to him. He's all, someone left, so wow, okay. Uh oh, they leave the room, that's not yeah, okay. Go. Oh, okay. Okay. With him. okay. Okay, great. Did you, did you accept? Uh, I'm not seeing where I can accept. Okay, click on the breakout room box, the little Join breakout, breakout room. Yep, yeah, there you go, thank you. Okay. You're welcome.
Oh, you're, uh, hold on. I brought, I brought Kenny back with me. Okay. Do you guys want to, um, want to join another group or are you guys pretty good? Well, we, uh, I should say Kenny came up with great ideas. And so I know that for our slide, there should be ample on there. Do you, okay. I don't have the other document up. I will pull it up. I'm going to give the others, they have three more minutes. Okay. So I'm giving them a little. Do we have, do we have something on all the slides or no? You know, I can screen share with you guys. You could take well, I can, I can pull it up. Yeah, we, we, we do. We do. I'm glad you guys had a nice talk. Let's see. Um, and it looks like we're just being uh, joined by Jasmine. Hi, Jasmine. Hi, Jasmine. Good morning. Hi. Hello. We're just finishing up in breakout rooms. So I'm going to bring everyone back in another minute or two. So if you just um, hang tight. Yeah, it looks like we have, uh, we had six rooms. Oh, that's interesting because we have someone in room, uh, standard number nine, room six. Yeah, that was you guys. Okay. Yep. Everyone's got some. Okay. Awesome. Something on there. Like I said, I don't know how you guys ended up just that small group of two. Everyone else has like four in their group. I think Patty's in a room of three. There was somebody else in the room with me, but then they, they left pretty quickly, so. Oh, okay. They didn't, they didn't want to go for a discussion, I guess. <laughs> Wasn't their thing. It, it worked out good. Okay, good. All right. Like I said, I gave the group, I'll, I'll pull them back in about, like I gave them a three minute mark. So we got maybe two more minutes at 11 o'clock. open the PowerPoint and see folks are adding images and some other cool stuff. Oh, I love the fact that some folks found images. I know. I know. So technologically savvy. I know, to do that on the fly like this. I know. Good. This is just a great resource for everybody, you know? Yes. So we can uh, kill the last three slides, four slides, right? Nobody was in those rooms, I think. Right, yep. I'm calling them all back now. They have one minute to come back. Hi, I wanna know if I could have the link to these slides that we are, that they're discussing about. Let me give you, I'm going to give you a link here to a participant guide where you can sign in and you'll also ah. get a link to the PowerPoint we're talking about. So if you open the link I just put in the chat, you scroll down, you want to add your name and your college and your role. And then if you scroll down from there, you'll see uh, breakout rooms, please open this link. And that's where you're going to get to the PowerPoint. Got it. Okay. Thank you so much. Oh yeah. You're no problem. You're welcome. Okay. So they have 16 seconds to come back. Okay, everybody, welcome back. Sorry to pull you from your rooms, um, but hopefully you had a, enough time to, um, you know, get get some thoughts down on your slides. Looks like you did, and we would love to hear hear out from from some of the groups. Um, and maybe we could get through all six slides if we're brief about it. You know, if everyone wants to say a few words, so I'm going to turn it over to Jan. Um, and have her facilitate this part for us. Yeah, so hopefully we are ready to rock and roll. I'm just gonna go down the slides and see if somebody is willing, you can unmute yourself, uh, willing to just share one key kernel of uh, good work that you did so that we're sharing the wealth of knowledge because I know that you came up with great stuff. So um, I'm gonna go to room one with Reggie, Irene, Nicole, and Miriam. Who would like to speak about what you came up with? Just one good idea. Are we? So, Thank you. 
what we discussed was like um like how point of views can help uh you know shape the content by allowing the students to be in the shoes of the uh, person that they're reading about or content that they're reading like such uh like if they're like in a history class they're re reading historical text they can be in they can put themselves in the in their shoes or in the author's shoes um and then have them think about like what was this author thinking at that time when he was writing um this piece and that's pretty uh -huh. much it love it love it thank you Thank you very much. Let's go to group two, room two. So here we've got um, Jeremy and Paulina. I love the graphics. You can unmute yourself. Maybe that's the uh, hurdle. Jan, I was also in that room. If Paulina and Jeremy um, don't feel comfortable speaking, I. Do either of you guys want to talk? You got some good stuff there. <laughs> yes, they, they came up with some great ideas. Well, I'll jump in very quickly. Um, we talked, we actually put this within the context of looking at um, obviously something that's just happened with regard to um, the election. And um, Paulina is teaching uh, or being trained to teach uh, in elementary school and Jeremy wants to teach high school. So we use that as a way of, of looking at how you could use diverse grade levels and still concentrate on obviously the election or voting. And so we spent a lot of time looking at um, how, or talking about how to look at sources critically, um, how, for example, you could take the, the quantitative component with um, a lot of the data that's coming out with regard to who voted, who didn't. And that would really bring us back to kind of show um, a little bit of, of what we've already been talking about with these differences between ethnic, racial, um, you know, diverse groups. And so we really use that as a way to, to bring in both uh, grade levels. Love it, love it. Thank you guys. Let's go to room three. We've got Sarah, Versil, Marisol. So we um, talked about, because it's all about evaluating and looking at the validity of text. So we talked about taking like two newspapers with different points of view, having the students read both and then discuss what, why the author wrote one or the other a different way, and then possibly taking it a little bit farther and looking into um, the background of the information of those authors and seeing how that impacted it. It's also yeah. came up that, you know, a lot about the fake news and the election and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. So important today, isn't it? Yeah. Let's go to room four. We've got Ava, Angie, I love the graphic. Allison's awesome. in there too. Oh, Allison, I'm sorry. Yeah. So if you're muted and you're talking, you need to unmute. So I'll just sort of start and maybe one of you I can chime in. I'll just oh, do perfect. it. Thank Sorry. You, thank you. Um, so we weren't really discussing, um, but I did add on there, I shared that one of the biggest things that we can do when analyzing text is really kind of put a spotlight on authors that maybe have been fighting for representation, um, who maybe aren't represented in the classroom as much. So I was thinking we can um, share and discuss and elaborate stories and experiences from Black, Indigenous, or people of color, uh, even people who are differently abled, mm -hmm. uh, kind of putting a spotlight on them and maybe using that to kind of reflect back and forth and how that maybe relates to their own lives if it does, or maybe just being able to discover other people's perspectives and other people's ex, um, experience and validating that. Okay, love it, Ex excellent. 
How about room five? We've got Yamil, Milani, and Andrea. You got the science page. And I love your graphics. I'm impressed. So Yamil, you want to speak on behalf of your group? Um, we were basically talking about how students should do hands-on projects um, for the community and how our population is affecting the climate of our world and having debates and discussions. Um, when having debates and discussions, we should have students on different sides of the debate so they can understand all the sides. Nice, nice, nice. Love it, thank you. And Kenny, we're going to you to represent <laughs> room six. Yeah, my group nominated me as a speaker. <laughs> All right. So for this one, um, like, like it's been said earlier, um, reading multiple viewpoints on the same topic or issue, you get to see how it affects different people or groups of people. Because oftentimes we only get to see one side of the story. Um, in terms of history, it's generally who ended up winning. So we don't get to see the full story and without knowing both sides, we're not able to make a, a, a really informed decision. Um, a couple other things that we came up with is look into the background of each author and see if any of that influenced uh, their viewpoint and why they wrote what they wrote. And then uh, beyond just text, uh, look at different types of media. So watch different news channels um, for social media. There's Twitter and then a lot of Republicans sound like they've gone over to Parler which is like another Twitter media, I guess. And then different news sites like BBC or Fox News or um, uh, CNN, stuff like that. So just try to get multiple viewpoints to kind of get both sides or multiple sides of the story. Thank you so much. These were great, you guys. And you will have, I mean, you have the link. And so you can keep that link um, and uh, riff on that. Uh, off of these ideas for your own use. We'd love to see that. We, um, as you can tell, we, we really want our educators to feel inspired and empowered to bring civic literacy and civic engagement into their professional responsibilities. Right. So let's go on. Yeah, can I, can I add a few things? I just noticed how many people were focusing on um, teaching perspective, right? And I think that is so important, especially at a young age, right? Some of these, these kids, um, they only know their little worlds, right? And right now it's our little Zoom worlds at our own homes and from our own positionality. And I think when you get them to read text with different perspectives and life experiences, not only from different culture, but within our own culture, right? In the, um, with the goal of promoting understanding and, and perspective taking in a way and empathy, right? And kind of like this ability to, to disagree, uh, you know, we can agree to disagree and it's okay and to formulate your own opinions around things, but those opinions should be informed opinions, right? How to unpack, deconstruct, research. I love how people are saying, look into the authors, like what, what's their background and how is that influencing the bend they're taking on some of these articles? I think these are amazing ideas mm -hmm. that could be done very easily in the classroom, right? And, you could, and it's not compromising any of your curriculum it's just working within the curriculum to layer in and infuse a civic minded pedagogy, right? And I think if more um, K-12 classroom, all K-16, even higher than that, all the way through, right? Mm -hmm. um, if more of us educators did that, I think by the time we have a graduated individual, they are a full citizen, right? And all that capacity, that fully educated citizen to participate thoughtfully in democratic society and actively. Um, so having said that, I don't know, Patty, if you want to add anything. Yeah, I was actually going to have you go back up to slide 14, I believe it is. Oh, the sure. re reinvisiting or reinvesting, excuse me, I'm sorry. Uh, let's see, it's reinvesting in the fundamental civic mission of schools. Keep going sorry. down. Here we go. Oh, it's 24. It. I apologize. Yeah. So I, I went back, I was looking at this and think about I, I know what was coming out of, of the group I was in and, and then just listening to, to those of you uh, do the, the report out as well as looking at your slides. 
go back now and look at these five very important points. And you all were talking about these, building knowledge, um, looking at those social issues, um, you know, having students, uh, giving, giving students the opportunity to actually dive or to dive into these topics and to really explore them themselves. Um, that appreciation, that open-mindedness, um, that different perspectives that, that I kept hearing coming up, um, that and the different viewpoints, uh, whether or not we're looking at political viewpoints or we're looking at cultural viewpoints, again, giving students the opportunity to do that. And I, I love what, what Kimberly and Jan are saying, you know, it, you, you don't have to add this on. It, it's something that's, that can be infused. It can be embedded. It's not extra work. It's how you frame your work, your assignments, the presentations that you're doing in your classes. Um, that third point of engaging in civic problem solving, um, so very, very important where students can be active rather than passive. Um, and that was the example that we were talking about in our group. Um, you know, you can talk about how the importance of voting, but until you start to really look at who votes, who, who doesn't vote, you start to deconstruct it, then it becomes something real. It's not just reading about it, but now you're really diving deep into it. And, and that problem solving, for example, looking at, at statistics and those kinds of things all become part of this. And then the civility, the ethical integrity, the mutual respect, all coming out of this. And then lastly, that most important point that Jan talked about, um, making those connections where this now becomes real. You know, this isn't about just reading in a textbook, but you're now being able to connect it to your real lives. Um, and that becomes so much a part of this kind of civic engagement mindset and the civic engagement learning. And with that, I wanted to share some text with you. There, there is no shortage of books that are out there on civic engagement. And I pulled out some of my favorites here um, with regard to um, civic engagement and higher education. Um, I actually have all of these. I, I purchased them off of Amazon, except the Community College and Democracy far over to the right. That one is available online through Campus Compact. That, uh, that one just came out. Um, about a month ago. And it has some very current articles looking at, at civic engagement in community colleges. The other one, um, if you look where they've all got their hands raised up, yes, that one is actually a free download. Um, I, I bought a hard copy, but then about a month later, they put it online. So you can actually download that one. It's teaching civic engagement across the disciplines. Um, it is available, uh, again, free of charge. And I would say if you were going to get started right where, where the cursor is that, that Kimberly is highlighting um, that particular text, uh, Educating Citizens, that is probably one of the most important um, and early publications looking at civic engagement. And again, while it stresses higher education, um, it still is very, very relevant to K through 12, because we're in this as a partnership. So again, all of these books are excellent reads. Um, and again, as I said, um, a couple of them are free of charge uh, and the others are available on Amazon. And if we go to the next page, um, I'm not as familiar with all of these, um, but I can tell you, I have several of these that, that I have read. Um, the project-based learning, the orange cover, um, many of you are probably already looking at the concept of project-based learning, but project-based learning is, is ideal for this kind of work in civic engagement because it allows students to really problem solve, to look at issues and, and social topics, um, to have them not only do the research, but to think in terms of how they can create solutions. And so project-based learning, and there are a whole slew of books out there, um, but that's just uh, one in a series that I highly recommend. Um, the blue cover, I'm sorry, the second row and the second one over project-based learning, the blue cover, that's actually part of this whole series coming out of the Buck Institute. Um, again, really good um, publications. You can see some of the other ones uh, on that first row, Teaching Civic Literacy Projects. Um, there's a lot of books out there. Uh, this one, De Democracy for Dinosaurs, literally just came out. Um, you know, again, addressing democracy in the lower grade levels or for younger uh, you know, students, but 
perfect if you're teaching, you know, small kids, uh, first graders, second graders, um, over, over to the far right, what kind of citizen. Um, again, talking about what we can do in K through 12 to really be, have our, our students think in terms of becoming good citizens. And then on the second row to the far left, Uncommon Civics. That is a book that is $12.99 on Amazon. And I will tell you, it is one of the best reads. And he has a very interesting approach at how we should be teaching civics, particularly in K through 12. Um, so I highly recommend you take a look at Uncommon Civics. It's well worth the $12.99. Um, and I sound like I'm making a plug for Amazon here. I have it on speed dial. And then one last thing I'm gonna mention, and this is a book that just arrived yesterday that I had ordered off of Amazon. It, it's only been out for a few weeks. It, and I don't know if you can actually see it, probably not. It's called Democracy is Not a Spectator Sport. It's a second edition. Um, and I will tell you, and it's, it's called the Ultimate Civic Engagement Handbook. And while I just started looking at it this morning, the author who is, uh, the, his name is Arthur Blaustein, while he is not particularly nonpartisan in his introduction, the book is full of resources with regard to organizations, particularly if you're looking at where do you send students or who do you contact. Um, I highly would, would recommend this book based on that information alone. Um, so again, democracy is not a spectator sport, a great resource, um, I think just with the organizational component um, that the, uh, of the organizations that are listed. So that gives you just some of the books that are out there. And then also certainly there are many, many um, sites that you can take a look at. Um, maybe some of you are already familiar with the 17 Sustainable Goals. Take a look at these that are coming out of the UN. Um, the idea that by 2030, the idea is hopefully that we can eradicate many of these goals. Um, this is a great way to get students engaged in looking at civic topics, particularly social issues that revolve around these 17 sustainable goals. Um, and so again, highly recommend that you take a look. You can get into the different websites, great discussions um, that you can, you can share with students. And then PBL, what formerly was called the Buck Institute, they have now renamed themselves. Um, and so PBL, it's public uh, or project-based learning. This is a wonderful site. You can get into it. You just have to register, but everything is free. Some great examples if you're teaching, um, particularly in uh, elementary or high school um, classes, I highly recommend that you check out this site. And then um, the Institute on, on Democracy, American Democracy, this actually talks a little bit about the work of Sandra Day O'Connor. Uh, and this, this actually goes into um, issues with regard to public speakers and things like that. Um, her work, she has been phenomenal. Um, as you know, a retired Supreme Court Justice who now uh, unfortunately is in failing health, but she, once she left the bench, wanted to make an impact on civics in our country, particularly for younger students. This is one site, but the better site, if we go back to the, the, reg, uh, the uh, links there that I think most of you would be really interested in is this one, iCivics. And she created this and it, it just, again, is full of all kinds of things that you can use in the classroom. It is specifically geared uh, towards K through 12 students, um, highly recommend it. Uh, and, and also just to give you a, 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 another reference to, to Sandra Day O'Connor, if you remember that publication I told you about Guardians of, of America, she was one of the um, individuals who was behind that work. So again, big supporter has been a phenomenal influence with K through 12 civic literacy. And then this last site, uh, K through 12 against uh, Generation Nation provides you with some explanations. Why does it matter? Um, access curriculum and resources. So if you just get out there and just start diving into these internet sources, you are going to find all kinds of things that can help you. I just want to note, Patty, thank you for going through all those. I've included those links on their participant guide. I've also included a snapshot of the civic engagement in higher education. Um, so uh, both of these book slides are on that participant guide that you have access to. 
Um, also, some people are asking me for our PowerPoint and I'm happy to send it out. If you do want a copy of it, please um, note it here on the sign-in sheet, you know, put it maybe here uh, after your name, please send PowerPoint and I'll follow up with you after our session today. Um, to continue on before we, um, we are gonna ask you to complete a survey in a moment, but we have maybe a few minutes, five minutes for uh, questions and answers if you have some uh, questions that you want to put in the chat, we're happy to um, answer those for you. I'll find my link to this and I'll also type in the, uh, the text I was just telling you about that I literally just started looking at today. Um, and that way, if anyone's interested, you can look, at, uh, uh, look this up on Amazon as well. Yeah, I mean, this is such a huge area and an hour and a half just doesn't do it justice. But we are hoping that We've been able to give you a flavor of what it means to be um, using like a civically engaged pedagogy and adopting that. And it's not something, at least at this point, that you're going to get a lot of direct instruction in through your credential programs, but it'll be something that um, I, I feel it's more of a, it's a practice, it's a philosophy, it's a, it's a belief system. It's, if you look at the Truman Commission report, which is free online, you can download the full PDF of it. It's really at the heart and foundation of our schools, which is to educate for democracy, educate the whole citizen, bring the exterior world into the classroom, right? And show the relationship between those two and not have these be separate things, right? That happen, that, that we are being educated as whole individuals. And yeah, you might have to educate that math lesson and that science lesson and that English lesson, but a theme across that is you're creating an educated, civically literate citizen who will go out into the world and do great things, right? And who will contribute to our democracy in, in wonderful ways and important ways. Right. So um, I do see something in the chat here from Jeremy Ramos. As a future teacher, what can be some great strategies to teach civic engagement, such as what are some important details to inform the students? And what are some tips I can avoid if there's any conflict during classroom discussion? That's a great question, Jeremy. Do we wanna, Patty, you wanna do it, Jan, or I can jump in? Yeah, I'm just looking, so what can be uh, some great strategies? Um, so one of the things that came up, and, and I'm just gonna mention it because um, I, um, I think it was our last uh, breakout where the gentleman talked about having the discussion in classes. Um, one, one strategy that you can use is called a dialogue. And, and again, if you, you get online and you Google the concept of conversation or dialogue, you'll find references to this, this kind of pedagogy. But one thing that oftentimes can, can really help in getting ideas out there is that, and this is so much a part of participatory democracy, is that we want voices to be heard. And so in a dialogue, you set ground rules and, and people have to abide by these ground rules, but you have prompts and the prompts are led by a facilitator. But through that dialogue, students have the ability to ask questions, they, they share, and then other things start to pop up in that conversation. And it's a great way to look at topics, some of which might be very controversial, but to have that dialogue, not a debate, because when you do a debate, you have to have a winner and a loser. A dialogue doesn't have a winner or a loser. It's a conversation. And where can we come and find our common ground? So we can have those differences, but through that dialogue and through that sharing, we learn about each other. And we also identify what are those kinds of common values and beliefs that we share, even though we may be so very different. So I, I would say that um, thinking in terms of dialogues is a great first start. Yeah. I would, I, I just want to offer um, giving students a choice about issues that matter to them so that what they're working on, and I'm a big fan of project based learning, to um, have them work towards something that they are really interested in and finding what they can do with their um, circle of influence to uh, address issues that matter to them, I think is really inspiring to students. And it makes what we're learning uh, relevant to our lives outside of the classroom. And I think that's really what we're wanting to accomplish with students is that uh, what they are learning matters. 
Right, and I, I agree with both of you, Jan and Patty. I think they're great suggestions. And then I'll just throw in my, my communication background because sometimes we deal with, um, you know, you're dealing with, with kids, right? So K through 12, sometimes they, they lack kind of the basic um, ground rules, understanding the ground rules for dialogue and conversation. So I might do things like say, you know, you, when someone's speaking, they have the floor, you know, we don't interrupt them, but maybe put a time limit on them too. So everyone gets like two minutes. And then another one I really like to do even in my college classes is before they can reply, um, they must paraphrase what the person said before them. And mm -hmm. paraphrasing is just putting in your own words, your understanding of, of what they're saying. And what does that do? That forces listening, right? It forces them to make sure that they are responding to the actual argument that was made. It gives opportunity to correct um, any misunderstandings. And so I would say um, get like three or four ground rules to set up the dialogue that teaches them these kind of things that we as adults kind of have internalized at this point, right? Um, I think that would be really helpful too. Mm -hmm. Maybe we have three more minutes. We can take maybe one more question and then I'm gonna show you the, the survey. So we do have a little survey for you to fill out. We'd love you to do that before you leave today. Any other questions for, that we can answer for you? These are great. Thank you, Jeremy, for, for posting. Okay. Well, I'm going to take us to the survey, but you can still have a minute to put a question in there if you want. But if you, this will take you about three minutes. This is our um, this is our survey here. The only tricky part is you got to when you scroll down here, you got to find the name of our session, <laughs> and it's really long. So we're right here: civic engagement and the K-12 classroom. Okay. Um, I do have someone asking if there's certificates that are awarded. I'm not sure that we, we don't give a certificate for participating today, but we will note those, are, some of you are probably doing this for your field work hours. We, I, that's why the sign-in sheet is so important. So make sure your name's there and we'll make sure we get this submitted to LA Teach. And I'm sure there'll be, there's a mechanism uh, there for them to make sure that they can uh, verify that you're, of your participation today. So if you can do that, we'd really appreciate it. And we're happy to stay on the line until you know, another minute or two and answer any questions you may have. But otherwise, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, and we really hope that um, our hour and a half together with you has inspired you to continue your journey in this area. I don't know, Jan or Patty, if you wanna say anything else. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, and I just want to say thank you all for being here. Um, this is a pleasure for us. Um, it's a passion for us. And so um, we hope that we have excited that passion in you as well. So I just, uh, can Sorry, I, just, uh, that's okay. Sorry, someone's asking about the survey link. It's right here on the shared doc, okay? Someone posted it. Where's the survey link? It's here. Go ahead, Jan. Sorry. Okay, good. I just want to thank you all for either being teachers or wanting to be teachers, right? The, it is a wonderful way to live. And um, having spent 40 years in it, I, I just think it's a way of uh, doing good in the world and um, being well yourself. So I just, I know it's not an easy uh, journey sometimes but I want to encourage you to uh, stay the stay on the path um, and know that um, you're going to be able to influence and help a lot of people. It's it's just magnificent. All right, thank you all. Have a great rest of your morning. Into your bye afternoon. bye. Thank you. Bye bye everyone. Bye everybody.